Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. We are in the final countdown. I know here in Canada, it is nine school days until Christmas holidays. It may be even sooner uh, for some of the school groups joining us today. But just because the holidays are coming doesn't mean we're taking a break from live science, exploration, adventure, uh, and conservation here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you head over to exploringbytheseat.com, you can see all the events that we have coming up over the next 10 or so days. Lots of live events from the field, including a short notice live event with Sand Cobb in South Africa uh, with the South African penguins. That should be a good one. So head over to the website, check that out and register if you'd like to tune in and join us. All right, we are taking another little trip to hang out with our friends at Hearts in the Ice, the team of Hilda Strom and Sunova Sorby two seasoned polar ambassadors and citizen scientists. Hearts in the Ice was created in 2018 as a global platform for education and social engagement to connect students, scientists, manufacturers, environmental organizations, and really all who care about the health of our planet. So to get everybody into one big conversation around climate change and ways that we can all be part of the solution. So we've been hanging out with Hearts in the Ice since September of 2019. We spent two years connecting with them uh, live at Bump Sabu. Uh, in Svalbard, where they spent the time overwintering, doing incredible citizen science projects with organizations around the world. And in the last couple of years, we've been catching up with them as they've been planning new projects, attending really important global conferences around the world, and finding new ways to kind of share not only the wonders of the North but uh, and the South, and but how they're in danger uh, as well and warming up so much faster than the rest of our planet. So I'm going to bring Hilda and Sunova in live with me right now. Here comes Sunova, probably in British Columbia, uh, or maybe Montreal. Montreal? I'm in Montreal. Got it. Awesome. And then Hilda is with us in Svalbard. It's so great to have you both joining us. Yeah, it's great. great to be here again with you, Joe. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this is, I love when we do the polar bear events because the two of you, uh, we're neighbors with them in a way that very few people ever kind of get to be. And, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of a daily thing on your mind while at Bum Sabu, many encounters, um, maybe some kind of a little surprising and, and just some probably just amazing and beautiful just to spend so much time around them. Yes, absolutely. No, that was great. And it was also a lot of fun to work with Yulm because we had a, we were his sort of, um, um, citizen science out in field uh, because COVID happened and uh, he could not go out in field himself. So we did the field work uh, following a polar bear mom. Uh, her name was N or is N26131 and Sunway and I named her Violet. And just being able to, to see her movement and follow her uh, tracks and also uh, the fact that she got two cubs um, Unfortunately, they, they died and um, she got another pair of cubs. But just see the evolution of the polar bears up in the Arctic and how they are struggling. And talking about struggling, this winter um, we have been very worried about the polar bear moms again because the temperature is really high, um, higher than usual, and they are struggling getting enough snow or finding enough snow to, to make a den. So. Uh, I'm sure Yoon will uh, both teach us more uh, about what's happening uh, up in Svalbard uh, these days. And also because he ha he still follows uh, a few of them with a collar around their neck. So he can tell whether the body temperature, how that's going up and down, whether they have actually found enough snow to insulate themselves and the coming upcoming uh, cubs. So I look forward to learn more about that tonight. So uh, thank you, Yoon, for joining us. And Sunava, what is happening in, in Montreal? Well, Joe, I just, I just want to say um, that it's, it's crazy that uh, we're in the third year with you. And um, that we're wrapping it up now. This is the last call of 2022 uh, with you. So um, that's absolutely incredible. And Hilda, I was just with you last week. And now, now you're in Norway and I'm in Montreal. And um, it's it's actually it's a little bit crazy how much traveling we've been doing, but we have been attending events that we think are very important. We were just in um, Toronto for Arctic Net, and it's the largest gathering of researchers uh, focused solely on all things Arctic. So we actually had uh, 
uh, the ability to spend a little time with our, our good friends from Polar Bear International. Um, and they're obviously good partners with Canada Goose and Canada Goose is supporting, you know, all the education outreach for this month of December. So a big shout out to them. Um, and what I'd like to do, Joe, is tee up. Uh, this is a big month, December, for a lot of different reasons. But one of them is that the the polar bears are um, in the dens. Um, hopefully, most of them are in the dens now. And so there's a two minute little video clip that that Polar Bear International and I want to encourage everybody to check out their website because they have uh, a host of educational resources on there and including a, a beluga cam. And uh, we were lucky enough to be up in Churchill with them in November. And, you know, I thought I had been close to a polar bear up in Svalbard, Hilda. But you know what? <laughs> Being like this far away when you're in the tundra buggy, seeing a polar bear, that was an experience that I will absolutely never forget. So um, I'm going to ask you, Joe, to tee up that two minute little video of how important the dens are for the polar bears. And then we'll bring Yon in uh, for the conversation. So thanks so much. Spring is a critical and vulnerable time in a polar bear cub's life. After years of studying the denning behaviors of polar bears and testing the ability to find dens hidden under the snow, two things are clear. First, a stable and uninterrupted denning process is essential to the survival of polar bear cubs. The loss of cubs contributed to the 40% decline of the southern Beaufort Sea polar bear population between 2000 and 2010. Second, aerial forward-looking infrared, or FLIR, surveys used to locate and protect maternal dens from disturbance have been missing over half of the polar bear dens known to be within surveyed areas. In a new research paper, FLIR surveys conducted by oil field operators between 2004 and 2016 found that only 45% of known dens were detected. FLIR can be an incredibly effective tool for research when conditions are just right. However, weather and other factors impact the accuracy of FLIR surveys, which is likely only to decline as global warming continues, bringing with it more unpredictable weather. Limitations of this technology suggest that denned mothers and cubs may be increasingly in harm's way. Given the threats to the southern Beaufort Sea polar bear population and increasing difficulty using FLIR in real-world conditions, scientists emphasize the importance of developing and testing other den detection methods. As the Arctic continues to warm and sea ice melts, the challenges polar bears face are immense especially polar bear mothers and their cubs. All right, so great, great video. And that technology seems like some great technology to be able to spot uh, them out on the ice, to spot those dens. But I don't like those numbers, the only spotting about 45% of, the, of the, what they expected to see. No, it's scary. It's, it's, it is scary. And, and the more we, uh, the more Hilda and I learn about uh, the polar bears and the dens and the, uh, how different denning is in the Canadian Arctic versus, you know, Svalbard, you realize how, um, how fragile the entire ecosystem is and how, how quick it could be to actually shift the, their ability to actually be safely in a den, like Hilda mentioned, um, we're we're worried about our violet. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can't think of a better speaker to come and join us and talk a little bit about uh, polar bears in Svalbard. I think we've had the pleasure of hosting you. This might be our third or fourth time, maybe yeah. maybe our fourth time that we've we've hosted him and he shared some of the incredible research he's doing out in the field. So I'm really looking forward to introducing him and and getting him into the action with us here today. He's fantastic. I have not met him in person, but you have, Hilde. Yes, for many years already. Um, yeah. yeah, so I I look forward. We both look forward to learn more at Yoon. All right. Well, I will talk the two of you away for now, and we will introduce Yoon. So here we go. Uh, all right. So joining us from Svalbard, we do have Dr. Yoon Ors joining us. 
He is a senior researcher who is responsible for the polar bear research program at the Norwegian Polar Institute. He spends a lot of time in the field and loves being out and experiencing nature uh, on Svalbard under all weather conditions. So I imagine there's some pretty, pretty cold blizzardy conditions from time to time. One part of his work that he does is satellite tracking polar bears to learn more about where they're going on the sea ice. And then, of course, how they're adapting to changing Arctic climates. So let's bring Ewan in with us right now. Hey, Ewan, how are we doing today? Hello, <clears throat> I'm fine. Thank you. And yourself? Great, great. Yep. Good, good. Well, it's great to have you with us. We have classrooms across Canada uh, and the United States joining us. They're going to have a lot of questions for you, I have no doubt. But uh, for now, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit. Okay, yeah. So what I have is uh, like a more general talk about polar bears, uh, mainly focused from Svalbard, uh, telling a bit about what we're doing in the field and what we have learned about them. Uh, and um, then you can just, uh, I don't know, I guess you you have uh, not so much possibility to interrupt me, is that so? Do you want me to just to talk first and then get questions afterwards or how does this work? Yeah, we'll get you to talk first and then we'll start yeah, bringing yeah. in some of the classrooms. Yeah, so uh, how long do you want me to talk? 10, 15 minutes or something? Perfect, or, yep. Yeah, okay. I'll just tell you something. But I have a small slideshow and then uh, we can... Um, Take it from there. Okay, so uh, I worked with polar bears in, in Svalbard, Norwegian Arctic, for uh, 20 years, I guess now, uh, when we get to New Year. Uh, so first, uh, just tell you what a polar bear is. I, I guess a lot of you uh, uh, know uh, quite a bit about polar bears already. But uh, uh, one thing is... Uh, uh, people fight a bit about, you know, grizzly bears, polar bears, what is the biggest bear? I actually don't know. Some grizzly bears are pretty close to some of the biggest polar bears, but they say on average, polar bears are a bit bigger. So the biggest bear we have, we have eight different species of bears, and polar bears for sure is the one that is most of an animal that uh, like meat. So they hunt seals and uh, uh, yeah, other things they can uh, they can take and, and eat birds. They take eggs and so on. While brown bears, they are more vegetarians actually, so they they eat a lot more different sort of foods. Uh, the polar bear males are much bigger than females, about twice the size. And the cubs, when they get born, they are actually very small. They are only like a bit more than half a kilo, but they grow very fast. So when they leave the den, they might be like ten kilos in in spring. And uh, when they're like one year old, they may be like half the size of so an adult polar bear. And when they're two years old, they're almost the same size as the mother. So they grow very, very fast. So uh, they can be, when adults, uh, usually between 200 and 600 kilos. Or if you uh, use pounds in Canada, it's a bit, uh, almost twice this of that. So up to 1,000 pounds or something like that, I guess. The females uh, uh, less than half the way of uh, male. Hmm. Uh, to put it a bit into perspective, if we compare with other mammals, the smallest mammal we have, the shrew, uh, you get about 100,000 shrews for each polar bear. But if you look at a blue whale, uh, you get 500 polar bears for every blue whale. So they're small if you compare to a whale, but they are big if you compare to uh, a shrew, I guess. Uh, one thing about polar bears uh, that make them being different from other bears for sure is that they are actually not a terrestrial, not, not like a land uh, living uh, mammal mostly. They are marine mammal, we say, because although they can be on land a lot of the time, they're always depending on the sea. So uh, you don't find polar bears anywhere in the world where you don't have sea ice at least part of the year. So they can be on land some places for most of the year, but other places they can be actually on sea ice for the whole year. But they can not be in a place where they have to be on land all the time. So uh, when we work with polar bears, uh, the first thing I guess we have to do is to be able to capture them because if you capture a bear, you can tell a lot more about them than if you just look at distance. So we do a lot of different things with, with the bear if we can capture it. And to capture a bear, 
because they're a bit dangerous actually you need to uh, take some precautions uh, so we use a helicopter and you use a rifle and you use a dart so you get it to get a sleep and when you shot a bear like that it sleeps for maybe an hour or something and you can do a lot of different things uh, because you don't get that far with the helicopter you can maybe uh, use a helicopter for like one one and a half hour then you need to go back so the best thing you can do is to have a boat that you can use to land the helicopter on so that's something we often do and then you can get fuel from the boat so very often when you work with bears we have both the boat and the helicopter and then uh, you see here on this picture you see the, all these pictures you see my colleague up to the left here, uh, he's making some sort of drug, which is like sleep medicine for the bear. You see a bear that has been uh, shot with a couple of darts. You see to the upper right here, you see an ear tag. So when we capture a bear, we give the bear a name, like uh, the bear Hilden Suniva talked about, uh, 26131. So then it will say N for Norway, and then this digits afterwards here on in the ear so we when we recapture that bear maybe later we know which bear it is we pull a small tip from uh, the bear like uh, behind this big carnivore tooth that they use to kill other animals they have this tiny one that is actually quite easy to to pull it's like only five millimeter big and they don't use it for anything uh, and if you slice that in thin, thin slices, you can actually see how old the bear is, just like you can do with a tree, because polar bears grow much faster in spring and early summer when they eat a lot of seals than they do the rest of the year. They get, get these rings in, in, in their uh, teeth. Uh, then we take a lot of samples that you use for different studies. You can see say something about what they eat, uh, and uh, you can say if they have pollutants uh, in them uh, and something about the health. So here we take a small fat sample from the bum here. We take a blood sample. Here, uh, my colleague Magnus take uh, some milk. Uh, and you see the cub here is also taking some milk at the same time. And here we take some notes about the bear. So the old fashioned way, just write on the paper. And then we lift the bear so we can measure how big it is. And finally, when the bear starts to move, then we are about to leave. Uh, but before we leave, we write a number on the back of the bear. So if we find that bear a week later, we don't want to capture that same bear again, not before the next year. So then we can see that, oh, number five, he's moved a bit. He's here now, and we leave him. So here is uh, a female. That, that's the mother with two big cubs. So you see that those are uh, almost grown to her size. So in a bit later, they will leave the mother. So when we want to learn more about polar bears, one of the way to learn a lot about bears is to use those colors. So we put on a color. It has what you call a GPS uh, thing here that takes an exact position. Uh, yeah, uh, so you know almost exactly where the bear has been walking and every second over or so it takes that position and it has some sort of a telephone system so it sent text messages to us every day and tell where it's been but it also tells how warm it is and how much the bear move and if the bear is swimming or not so we get a lot of information so if you plot this data you can see where the bear have been and one important thing we have learned is that if you, this is Svalbard where we do the field work. If you meet a bear here in spring, you actually don't know if it stays here their whole life or if they move far, far away. So this bear here you see walked over to, this is Russia, over to Asia, also in Russia. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, it's like 800 kilometers from here to here uh, or 500 miles. So it's long, long distances. Uh, it went into den here, but then you have this other bear here that had been in Svalbard a whole year, just in a very small area. 
This uh, other track here shows a bear that we had four years of data on and that went almost to the North Pole three years in a row here. So they do different things and you wouldn't know if you don't couldn't be tracking them. One thing we also learned is that the bear swim a lot. So when I started 20 years ago, some people said that maybe the bear could swim up to 100 kilometers. They thought maybe so, but they didn't know. No, we have seen bears that have been swimming several hundred kilometers because we have the data from these colors, uh, which is a good thing because they have to swim longer and longer distances because the ice is melting. So to get between hunting areas and areas where they, for example, go into den, they, they need to be able to swim. But it also costs a lot of energy to swim in cold water. You can try yourself, try to swim 100 kilometers when the water is like minus one or minus two Celsius. It's um, not so easy. We also learned actually that they are quite good at diving. We have had many bears that have been diving deeper than 10 meters. So this one bear went on to 13 meter. Why do they dive? They dive uh, when they hunt seals in between ice flows. So this is from Svalbard. That's actually me here many years ago and, and a seal. And to catch that seal, the bear might dive underneath the ice flow and then pop up on the other side and throw itself up on the ice flow to take the seal. But it also eats kelp that they, it takes from the bottom uh, several meters deep. Um, here is something we had a, a student working with us that looked at how uh, female adult bears did, how they use different areas, generation after generation. So one very interesting thing we saw was that this, the bear that was in family, they used the same area as their mothers did, or their sisters. So here is like one mother and two daughters that used a small area here, a mother and a daughter that used uh, an area up here, uh, a mother and a daughter that used this small area here mother and daughter here, and two sisters down here using the same area. So we also have genetics that shows that they, they stay in the same area over many generations. They don't move a lot. Uh, they can like walk over to Russia, some of them, but those that stay in Svalbard, they stay in very, very small areas. And we find them the same places uh, year after year. When the bears get old, they die as all other animals do. Uh, and if bears get more than like 15 years old, we say that they are quite old. Uh, when they get 20 years old, they, they are very old uh, and they usually die before they are like 25 at least. And some die when they are like between 15 and 20. The oldest bear we've had at Svalbard, uh, I think died in... Uh, uh, this fall, a few weeks ago, and she was 30 years old. That's probably, or, or maybe the oldest bears we've ever captured. Then uh, polar bears, as um, Hilda and Sunivat talked about, they have this thing that they, they make their dens in the snow. And snow is actually insulating. So it's very, very good for the bears that it's snow, because inside the den, it's never get very, very cold. It, it get maybe zero degrees or a bit warmer than that, but it doesn't get uh, below freezing temperature, at least not when you have a female bear inside that heats up uh, the, the room. So this is like from a big uh, den uh, and you have these chambers where, where the uh, small cubs stay and they, they can stay there for, uh, the mother can stay for four, five, six months, so long periods. Uh, and the cubs, maybe three, four months in, in that then. And they are naked when they get born. So if it was very cold, they wouldn't make it. Uh, what do they eat, the bears? They eat seals. They actually eat whatever you give them. But the thing they really depend on and they eat mostly is seals, particularly ringed seals that are very common uh, all over in the Arctic. In some areas, like in Svalbard, this much bigger bearded seal, it's also very important for polar bears. Uh, and they eat harp seals and uh, hooded seals. They eat uh, mostly seals that you find where it's ice, but they, they also eat uh, 
harbor seals in some areas and, and uh, a lot of other animals that they can find. In Svalbard, we have reindeer. And we have seen in the later few years uh, that uh, they take more reindeer than we early thought they did. Uh, mainly, uh, we think, because bears are using more time on land and because it's much more reindeer now than it used to be. Reindeer actually like that it gets warmer because they get a longer season, more to eat. So that's good for the bears too, that it gets more reindeer. Uh, and uh, they managed to take... Uh, Reindeer quite frequently in Svalbard, we see more than we thought earlier. So here is a small uh, reindeer calf that had been killed by a bear just before we came there. Uh, cubs, they mostly uh, drink milk, which is extremely fat, between uh, 30 and 70 percent fat in, in the milk they drink, particularly when the cubs are small, it's very, very fat. Uh, but here you see two small cubs that ate uh, parts of a ringed seal that the mother killed just some minutes before uh, we captured the mother, and uh, the cubs just started to eat on, on uh, the seal. Uh, this bear actually had cached some small whales uh, that uh, had problems to breathe, so they came up this small hole in the ice and the bear was just standing there and waiting for the whale and he had eaten one small whale when we came and this is the other one that he tries to cover with snow so they are able to catch a lot of different uh, animals if they're really lucky they find a big whale and then they can have food for one or even two years so sometimes you know the whales also die and then they strand sometimes uh, and bears eat on them they also uh, more and more take uh, food they find on land because when it's not sea ice, they, they need to be on land. So here you see uh, a mother with two small cubs that used to eat egg, bird eggs and, and birds uh, every year in summer. This is uh, what we have found out about this bear from having the collar on her, is that she stays like 10, 9, 10 months every year in this area here. And uh, this is the area where Hilda and Suniwa uh, stayed. So uh, they probably have seen this female. And every year she swims over here and swims over here and she hunts harbor seals that uh, live on this island here in summer. And then she goes back and every year she hunts birds and take eggs here. And we know that she also hunt reindeer in this area here. She is in then this year. And no, she has a problem uh, that uh, was briefly mentioned, that it's actually been very warm in Svalbard this often. And we can see from the den that is on this side of the fjord here that uh, it's colder inside the den than it usually is. That is strange maybe when it's warmer outside, but it's just because it's very little snow and the snow insulates. So hopefully she gets more snow uh, before she gives birth. So uh, warm weather is a problem for the snow that they use for dens, but more than anything, uh, it's bad for polar bears because the area they most like, uh, the sea ice where they can hunt seal, is uh, melting. And uh, it was briefly uh, mentioned that in Svalbard, in this area, it has this thing had go gone much, much faster than anywhere else in the Arctic. We have lost more than one month of the season with sea ice every 10 years, the last decades. So now it's like I started working with polar bears 20 years ago, and now it's uh, more than two months less that you have sea ice every year on average in Svalbard than it, it used to be. And many of the bears, if they follow the ice to hunt, they are found much further north than earlier. So that's why it's bad uh, for bears. Then bears often use more time on land. Uh, one problem with that can also be that they meet people more often. And what we also see is that they often break into cabins and sometimes they get in confrontations with uh, humans. 
uh, not everybody like when they come and, and uh, destroy your cabin like uh, like here. Uh, this female and the cub here, we had to move away from Longyearbyen where most of the people live uh, in autumn 2020. And one of her earlier cubs actually killed a man uh, uh, close to the settlement there. So polar bears can be dangerous as well, and more so when they are forced to be more on land. Here you see a polar bear that attacked a dog on a meteorological emet station in, uh, in Svalbard. But the dog did okay. What got a bit scared. Okay, that was... Uh, some uh, about what we do, uh, a bit of information about polar bears, and then I guess uh, you can start asking some questions. All right, sounds good. Ewan, thank you so much for a great uh, presentation, and it's uh, great information you're able to get from those satellite tags to really kind of tell a story of, of their lives, but also how their lives are changing and how they're trying to adapt to that. Mm. All right. Well, it is that time. We're going to turn things over to the classrooms. If you are tuning in live via YouTube, use that chat sidebar and send us in some questions. We'll work some of those in. If you are in a camera spot, we're going to start grabbing uh, some of you to come in and join us as well. And we will ask those questions. Sunava had to run. So Sunava has left the call for today, but we have Hilda still with us and she'll be able to help answer uh, some of those questions as well. So let's get started here. We've got Miss Evans' crew hanging out with us, some grade five sixes uh, in an audio spot. So let me bring them in here. How are we doing, grade five sixes? How are we doing, guys? They're loving it. I'm getting all kinds of comments in our. We're on. We're a virtual class, so we're watching virtually. Gotcha. My, my chat is blowing up. So um, one okay. of the questions I have. Um, let's see. One of them they want to know is how tall they are. The bears, like at the shoulder. Ah, uh, as the shoulder when they stay upright. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Stop the next they're not. They, they, they're not so very tall when they just stand on all, all four legs. Uh, a a grown-up uh, uh, adult uh, would be probably a bit taller than a male polar bear. So they they are not that tall. Uh, so uh, maybe they are like one and a half meter or something uh, up to the head, but I'm guessing a bit. What I do know is how long they are. So if they stand upright on the hind legs, you know, they would be from uh, a big male would be two and a half meter almost from the wow. tail to the to the nose, Oof. and then they stand on their legs. So then they would be maybe three. Uh, and uh, if they raise their front legs as well, they would maybe be close to three and a half meter. Oof. So then they're quite uh, tall. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, if that chat's blowing up, let's grab one more question. Okay. Um, my kid, one of them, um, ah, I've got two really good ones I have to decide. They're just blowing me up. Um, one, of them, one of my kids wants to know, what is the most interesting thing you've learned studying polar bears? Huh. Uh, maybe what has impressed me most is the how far they can swim. And also that when they swim, we've had bears that have been swimming continuously for up to three, four days, then had a few hours break and been swimming for three days again. And that when they swim, they swim all the time. Then they don't stop and sleep, you know. So you can see that the polar bear can maybe swim for 70, 80 hours. Wow. Just swim, 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 swim without sleeping in uh, water that is like uh, one, two degrees minus Celsius. Uh, so that they can, and maybe three kilometers per hour. So they swim long, long distances and they swim continuously. All right. Uh, Great question. Yeah. yeah. Can I Great. add to that, Joe? Of and, course. And Hello. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, funny you say that, Jon, because what we what uh, impressed Sunwa and I was the the endurance of the the, the cubs, how strong yeah. they are to follow their mom. They can yeah. and they they have they are so small, so they st they kind of run after their mom, and, yeah. and his mom can walk for maybe five six hours, and the cubs are like running after her. Oh, that's yeah. amazing! Yeah. So small. Yeah, yeah. And this is, you know, this is typically what uh, people being out there like you, 
see and we don't see it. We we just we we, we just uh, I just look at the data from the colors yeah. and I know how fast and how far the mother moves. So I know the cabs necessarily follows her, but we don't see it, you know. Mm. So uh, yeah, that's the thing we. We see yeah. very different things than people being out there all the time. Sometimes, of course, we also are lucky and see <laughs> see behavior, but a lot of the time we just uh, fly a helicopter and scare them. <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah. Uh, amazing just to be there and, and observe. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing how uh, how strong they are and being so small, running after yeah. them. Yeah, for hours. One one uh, maybe surprising thing with the cubs that. Uh, you learn when you capture the mother is you know how, how tame they are yeah. so uh, you think maybe that scaring bears with a helicopter is not so nice and it is not but and they, they run away and then you land and and you walk over and maybe the cubs are a bit scared of you and then after three minutes they just see okay my mom is cool and she's not scared and those people don't do us anything wrong and then they just maybe fall asleep or they start licking you or they, they it like, takes like, I used to say it's faster to tame a polar bear than a dog. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. We're going to take a little trip to Toronto now. We have uh, a group joining us from Bayview Glen Upper School. <laughs> so if you're ready, we'd love to get a question. Come closer. Right. Close. <laughs> um, yeah, so based no, off your research, <laughs> Uh, based off your research, is there anything that you're most hopeful about? What's that? <laughs> uh, I said, based off your research, is there anything that you find about? Hopeful. So anything that makes you hopeful from the research? Yeah. yeah um, I mean, uh, there is no doubt that uh, climate change is a big threat to polar bears. But uh, what is uh, good news, I guess, is that in, in Svalbard, where uh, things have gone in really the wrong direction with a lot less uh, sea ice, we still see that the polar bears are doing uh, fine, uh, which is to me surprising. Uh, the, the, the bad thing, of course, is that we think it's going to be worse, that is continuing to, ice is uh, continuing to disappear. But it's still good news to see that the bears are doing, uh, they're coping so well, at least so far. Hmm. All right, you guys want to squeeze another one in? Um, yeah, so because of climate change and the melting sea ice, do you expect that the polar bear diet is going to change completely? The, the, the diet? Was that? Yeah, their diet. Yeah. Yeah, it, yes, absolutely. And we already see it. We, we already see that uh, the bears that live in Svalbard, close to the coast, uh, they eat different things than those that follow the ice. And we also see that there has been a change over time, that bears eat more terrestrial food uh, compared to what they used to do. They eat more birds and eggs. We both see it directly, but we also see it from the um, samples we take. So you can study the the the, the fat, uh, the hair, and so on, and you can get uh, uh, some what you call signatures. You see how it's built up, and you can say something about if they eat a lot of food from the ocean or from land, and and also partly what type of animals they eat. So we see that it changes, yeah. And we've seen that uh, many other places in the Arctic as well in other studies. You see that uh, it already changes, and it it will uh, continue to change. Mm. All right, great questions. Uh, Miss Garner's third graders are in Illinois, I believe. Let me bring them in front and center. Hey, third graders. Hello. I, if um, if a polar bear um eats is done eating like its food, do they eat the bone or do they just toss it aside? They. Uh, it's a good question. They it's usually don't eat the bone. I mean, they're a bit like dogs, I guess. If they're really desperate, they might eat everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, what the polar bear uh, think is that the fat is the good uh, food. And the meat mm -hmm. is uh, a bit like junk food. So if they're really hungry, they eat uh, the fat and the meat. If they're desperate and haven't eaten for three months and they find some bones or a piece of tree or anything, 
they might eat that as well. But usually, if they think they have more than enough food, they eat uh, fat and they throw the meat uh, and don't eat it, and they don't eat the bone. Hmm. Thank you. Right. Third graders, you got another one there for us. Um. Well, what would happen to humans if polar bears got extinct? Uh, it wouldn't make such a big difference to humans. Uh, we, a lot of humans will miss the polar bears a lot, I think. Uh, if the polar bear go extinct, it probably also means that a lot of, a lot of other wildlife species that lives up in the ice also go extinct. So there will probably be some seal species, some whale species, uh, and also a lot of small fishes and things that live in the ocean that... Uh, we ha you have only very sea ice, and it will be a very different ecosystem. Uh, and it, it, it's not so good, but humans can probably still do okay. But uh, at th another thing that is maybe more important in some way is that if polar go bears go extinct, humans will have a lot of other problems, mm -hmm. maybe like fresh water and, and uh, other things to think about. Because when polar bears go extinct, if they do, it's because we have a lot of other problems with climate. Hmm. Exactly. That's a great question. And it's a big question. Hard to answer, but really, really good question. And and uh, let's hope we are able to change uh, our the human's behavior so that is, uh, is not happening to mm -hmm. neither the polar bears or to us. Yeah. All right. We're going to head to Edmonton, Alberta now. Some fourth and fifth graders hanging out with us. I'm going to bring them in. Hey, Edmonton, how are we doing? So if you want to send me questions in the chat, I think I see one already because uh, we know the mic's not cooperating. So the first one, if a polar bear is desperate, would it ever eat its own cub? Uh, um, I actually, uh, I'm absolutely not sure how much data we have on that, but I think what could happen or what do happen is that cubs often die of starvation and uh, then I think it could be that the mother would eat the cub. Uh, I'm not so sure if they like kill their own cub. Uh, I think usually they, they they do not do that. They are like, uh, uh, it's a very strong instinct that they sort of give the cubs uh, a chance. Uh, but what we do know is that cubs often starve to death and are not eaten, that you can find dead cubs that are uh, have starved to, to death. Uh, so uh, another thing is that uh, bears, particularly male bears, can kill other bears to eat, and that's often cubs. So, so the mother and the cubs are very afraid of adult male bears. All right. And that's the thing with polar bears. They spend so much of their time out on the sea ice that there is still a lot of mysteries. We don't get to watch them uh, and see all of that behavior as easily as, you know, say something a little closer to land in the forest or something. Mm. It's it's a, actually a fantastic uh, question because, as you said, Jon, uh, we've seen several or through your research, we see that uh, male polar bears are killing uh, cubs. But what mm. we see, and, and that there are enemies out on the sea ice, because that's their sort of their food uh, tray is, or their, that's where their food are. But up in Churchill, we saw male polar bears and, I mean, all uh, genders and ages playing uh, and having fun together, being in mm. harmony with each other, waiting for the sea ice. But that was on, la on land, waiting for the formation of the sea ice. So mm. when it's no food around, they actually are so friendly towards each other, which was completely new to me because yeah. I live up in Svalbard and see them only on, on the sea ice and mm. fighting for their food. So that was uh, a different behavior. You can also see sometimes on those whale carcasses, you can sometimes see lots and lots of bears uh, together and they have more than enough food. Yeah. So then they, they will leave each other, uh, you know. Mm. Without fighting. Mm. All right. We're going to grab another question here. We're going to go to Boise, Idaho this time. We've got a crew hanging out there uh, with Miss Ritter. Let me see if we can get them in here. Uh, Ms. Ritter, if you're there, if you want to activate the mic for us. There we go. Let me bring you in. Hey, Can Boise. You 
Can you hear me? Yeah, we got gotcha. you. Perfect. Um, we wanted to know um, what can students do to help the decreasing polar bear population? That's a great question. You want do you wanna you wanna yeah ask? I, if you or I do uh, g give it a, a try uh, you 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 can have a try if you want yeah you probably yeah <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> yeah it's it's a it's a big question but it's all about yeah. uh, I think trying to fight the climate change mm. uh, fossil fuel and uh, how we. Uh, harvest um, our uh, how we sort of protect our uh, mother earth so it's yeah. all about trying to keep the temperature as low as po possible for that sea ice to continue to to be part of our the whole ecosystem because the sea ice is a is a huge part of what's happening in the ocean uh, mm -hmm. Also, uh, underneath the sea ice, uh, a lot of the algae has their first stadium of life. And that is part of the food chain for the bigger animals and all the way up to the seals and then up to the polar bears. And, and also the sea ice and the, um, uh, the cryosphere, everything that is white on Earth, the uh, ice shelf and the glaciers and the sea ice is very important for the Earth to keep cold. Because the, the white parts of, of the Earth, both on the South Pole and the North Pole, reflects the sun, uh, the sun coming or the, um, the warmth coming from the sun. So it's as if the, the, the Earth take on a white T-shirt and keeps it cold instead of having a black T-shirt that makes everything feels warm and accumulate the, the temperature. So it's, um, it's a big, big question. Um, it's, it's all about us managing how we live our lives and how we, uh, when we get old enough, uh, stay in school and, and, and really get good at what we're doing. Like you guys, um, uh, being at school now to do that, do your, um, themes and your directions of work better than we do. And also to vote. But fossil fuel and how we live our lives, I think, is a it's a big um, topic here when it comes to saving ice and polar bears. Hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, always a good one to share with students is just tell other people what you learn. It's an easy mm. thing you can do. Uh, tell them what you learned, why it's important, and you know, encourage through your actions. If other people see your actions, you can kind of be a leader in your classroom at home. Uh, and things like that for making changes. Absolutely. All right, Idaho, do you have one more question for us? Yes, we have one more question. Um, right. We wanted to know, do you know how long polar bears can hold their breath underwater? Hmm. I I don't know, and I don't, I'm fairly sure nobody knows, uh, but there was a paper uh, a few years ago by a guy called Ian Sterling from Canada, that is the most famous polar bear researcher around, I guess. Uh, where they had observed a bear diving, and I think they had about three minutes on the longest period where that bear was underwater, so they knew that it had been swimming at least three minutes holding its breath. But uh, I would maybe put money on that the bear could have been staying quite a bit longer if it needed to. Sure. One, one thing we often see, actually, when we're out is sometimes you can see that bears hunt seals by swimming underneath the ice and in, in sort of open leads, but where ice has frozen again. Uh, and they break the skull from underneath through the ice and have a look and see to orientate. And then they swim maybe 10, 20 meter break through this ice again. Uh, and I don't know for how long they can do it and how they do it, but but I, I, I think they are, I, I, I would think that they can do it for longer than people do, and people have done it for longer than that bear did. Mm. So I would say quite a few minutes, but but nobody knows for how long, <laughs> I right. think. Yeah. So we have one more class we have one more here on camera. Here on camera. Fourth and, or third and fourth graders in Douglas, Ontario. Douglas, Ontario. Canada, how are we doing? Canada, how are we doing? Good, thanks. Um, how, why do they make their dens warm if it's bad for them? Uh, they, uh, they, 
they, they don't they don't make the the dens uh, warmer than uh, what is good uh, maybe i didn't explain well enough if it's warm outside the the it, the snow melts so it's a problem for the bears that it's so warm that they can't make a den uh, but if they have enough snow they hope to get it so insulated that it's actually quite warm but there is actually sort of an interesting problem that when it gets very warm inside the den let's say that it gets three four five degrees plus the snow start melting uh, it's not like the whole den melts so that's not the problem but the problem is that it get ice and you don't don't get oxygen that the bears need so what we see is that every second third day or something the bear have a sort of a period where they get very active when we think they scrape away the ice to get oxygen into the den hmm. Hmm. interesting all right and then you also see a, at the same moment you see that the temperature in the den drops quite a lot huh. so they, they let in so cold air hmm. Yeah. Again, really cool to have that technology to be able to make those observations from afar uh, and kind of put those puzzle pieces together that you can't see uh, mm. otherwise. Yeah, that's great. So let's grab one more question. Let's grab one more question. question. Ontario Ontario crew. Crew. Ontario crew. Um, how big are the cubs when they're born? They are uh, they like uh, six, seven hundred grams. On average. Uh, so what is that? Like uh, one and a half pound or something? Yeah, do, do you do you think in pound in, uh, in Canada? Canada? Yeah, pounds. Yeah, yeah, they are like one and a half pound. Yeah, a big, uh, big uh, pack of butter, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they are one of the mammals that are have smallest cubs if you compare to the size of the mother. Yeah. And also no yeah. no hair, no fur. They are naked, yeah. So they're like red and without hair when they get born. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, Jon, I'm curious, when are you going to be out in the field next? Um, probably mid-March. Mid-March? Yeah. And then how long is a field session usually? Uh, about four weeks. About four weeks. Yeah, until we're an empty of money, I guess. Hmm. All right. And then Hilda, what's next for you? I know we'll connect in January, uh, I'm sure. But what's what's <laughs> up for you? What's coming up next? Well, first now it's some, uh, some holidays coming up, which mm -hmm. is going to be so nice. And then it's going to be some more traveling. We're very um, c conscious about our traveling, that we make sure that we travel only to the events that we feel that we have to mm -hmm. uh, or where it's really useful for us. So next time we're connecting with you, Joe, is going to be from the ship that we are godmothers for, uh, MS Fritjof Nansen from Hurtiruten, and that is going to be from the Antarctic. So we are going all the way uh, from the Arctic and to the Antarctic and uh, looking at penguins and, and the ecosystem and the sea ice and the glaciers and the ice shelves down there. All right. Well, we love trips to Antarctica. So classrooms who are tuning in, keep your eye out for the newsletter when we announce that opportunity. Uh, and it's a beautiful ship. So it'll be really cool to get a chance to see maybe some of the ship as well. Um, Jan, it's always a, a pleasure to have you join us. Keep up the great research and uncover some of those yeah. polar bear secrets for us. I will try. Yeah. <laughs> Hilda, thank you so much. It's always great mm. to see you. And a shout out to Sunova, who I know is, is on her way out to another meeting. Yes, and also just a little shout out again to Polar Bear International that has a lot of uh, content when it comes to what's happening with the polar bears and also um, things that we can uh, focus on. And Sunova and I always encourage you kids to, to become citizen scientists, as Sunova and I was uh, at Bamsebu, uh, being able to work for and together with uh, experts like uh, you to understand more what's happening out there, both with the wildlife and the natural life uh, and, and also climate change in, in general. It's a lot of, lot of fun. So, uh, so try that out. Yeah, absolutely. 
Before we do sign off, I will share that link here. If you want to visit heartsintheice.com, you can find out some more information, learn a little bit more about some of that citizen science, uh, and probably keep track of what Hilda and Sunova are up to next. To our classrooms, it's always a pleasure to have you joining us live from different places. Thank you so much for the amazing questions. And I'm going to let you, the groups who are still with us, in right now. If you want to get nice and loud, a big goodbye and thank you uh, before we sign off. Thanks so much for joining us today, everybody. Bye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Enjoy your holidays. We don't have before, and we are going to sign off for today. All right. Bye.